in a week of prayer and fasting. Um, it's been an amazing week. Shout out to everyone who uh, came on to the 6 a.m. prayer, for everyone who watched it later, or for everyone who was doing their own thing during this week. We were really consecrating ourselves and posturing ourselves for this divine do-over. We're, de we're posturing ourselves for um, setting, being anchored in a way that we're not drifting. And we are posturing ourselves to be a community, that like, this is us. And th this is the last day of our Divine Do-Over series. But we just took a moment last week to pause and to seek God about our church. And I don't know about you, but I feel like we have planted seeds for revival. Amen. We have planted seeds into a move of God that I believe God wants to do in Berkeley. And I am uh, declaring that people will look back over the year 2021 and 22 and say, didn't God do a mighty move in Berkeley? Does anyone else believe that with me? Didn't God move? It was just like as the Azusa um, revival. It was just as of the latter rain movement. I believe we are positioning and posturing ourselves for that kind of move and revival. So today our topic, um, as we go into this sermon, our sermon topic today is show us your glory. Amen. Can someone say that with me? Lord, show us your glory. Amen. This is what um, God is doing in our hearts and in our minds. I don't know if this is your prayer, but this is the prayer of our church. Lord, show us your glory. It's undeniable. It's undeniable that God loves community. Um, we were designed like this. We were designed not to live this Christian life alone. All right. This is this was God's idea. Um, we're not meant to be isolated. We're not to, meant to be lone wolf Christians. We're not, that's just not how God designed this. Um, when it comes to community, we're kind of like, you know, when you're at home, hopefully some of y'all are at home in the rain, you have a fireplace. Have you ever had a fireplace, a fire going in your fireplace? Or have you ever been camping and you got a campfire going? You know, the fire works better when all the logs are together and they burn brightly. You get one little log that rolls away, that little log is, gonna, <laughs> is not going to be on fire. It's going to be cold and dead. That's how community works for us. As more of us are together, that's when the fire burns bright. And it's just, I don't know about you, but do you know, like, there's a such thing as a group vibe. You know what I mean? I can't put my finger on it, but it's like when you walk into a function and it's like, it's packed and there's people, there's a vibe, there's an energy that you get when the, when the place is jumping and it's like people and there's a line, it's just a thing, as opposed to when you walk in somewhere and it's just like a few people and it's kind of dry. I don't know if you've ever been there before. But there's something about a group vibe. We're just not meant to do life. We're not meant to do church alone, right? And um, even in this pandemic, this is what this pandemic really pointed out to a lot of us. And that was the most heartbreaking part of the, of the pandemic is that it isolated us. It kept us from physical touch. It kept us from hugging each other. It kept us from being a, a in community and being with people, which is a very foreign concept to the people that God created to be in community. Amen. So um, at, over the course of this series, we've labeled uh, what we want our community to be as an usness. You guys remember the word we we are leaning into usness. And as our uh, as Chosky, well, shout out to Chosky in the chat. She came up with. Um, our, our Jesusness. We are leaning into our Jesusness. It needs to be a t shirt. We need to label. We'll give you all the credit and royalties, Chasi, for that. Um, our Jesusness. This is what we are leaning into. And it's not just some foreign concept that I'm just making up or it's a great idea, I don't, you know, that I just pulled out of a hat. No, I actually have biblical proof that God loves community, and God loves our community and corporate worship. Let's just take a look really quick at Psalms 95. Now, look, 
Today, we're going through some scriptures. Are y'all ready? Y'all ready to put your Bible scholar caps on? We're going into, we're going to go in. So make sure you're ready to scroll or turn your pages. We're going through the word today, all right? We're starting at Psalms 95. And this is about our usness. Check out this. This verse right here could just preach all by itself. So let's just lean into it. It says, Psalms 95, it says, oh, come. And I want you to emphasize, I've emphasized every part where it's plural, all right? So it says, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with what? Thanksgiving. And make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Why? For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his. Come on. And he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Why? For the Lord, he is our God. We are the people of the, his pasture and the sheep of his hand. This is what we are talking about, a community worship, a community time where we're not just coming. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. That is a time. We do have a time for that. But there's also a time where we, us, let us, our, that we come together and worship the Lord. Are y'all tracking with me? All right. So we are called to live in the both and. Somebody say the both and. We are called to live in the both and. Let me explain. The both and, the both and is that we need a personal Pentecost. Y'all remember we talked about that back in June? That each one of us need to experience in some form a personal Pentecost. We have our own relationship with God. We are tending to our own fire. We are invoking the flames in our own hearts. But and, a both and, we also need corporate worship. We need a balance between the two. Now, prior to the pandemic, it was easy just to rely on the corporate side and not really have to tend too much to your personal side because I'll just go to church. So this is showing us how we need both and. Somebody say both and. We need both a personal and a corporate relationship with God. We need a balance between the two. Now, when I say corporate, I understand that we are still in a pandemic and we're still virtual. But again, COVID has showed us that being in a building doesn't also, doesn't, isn't the only way to necessitate community. We can all be together in community, be it virtually, be it together. We can be together. Our hearts can be mended together when we're unified. We could be watching, you could be on a, on a TV, you could be on a phone, you could be in the building. But as long as our hearts are unified together, then we are in corporate anointing. We are in corporate worship, no matter where we are. Do y'all y'all track them with me? I got one witness in the building. I got Sister Daisy with me in the building, and that's all I need. I just need, that's all we need. Me and Sister Daisy in here having church. All right, so, um, so. I would, this, is the, this is the whole crux of what I want to tell you about today. Something powerful happens in corporate worship. Amen? Corporate worship leads to unity, and unity leads to corporate breakthrough. Y'all feeling me? Corporate worship equals unity. Unity equals a corporate breakthrough breakthrough. How many know that there is a corporate breakthrough that a lot of times we're just looking for my breakthrough, my blessing, my healing, but there's a blessing that God has on the people of God for all of us when we come together via virtually or in person that God will do a special work. And I know that you even feel that even when uh, Minister Lauren was, was worshiping that we can all feel it no matter where we are. There is a corporate anointing 
that we can lean into. And I got another verse to prove it. Y'all ready? I told you we're putting on our, our biblical scholar hat today. We're moving through verses. I want to show you Jesus' prayer for us. Did you know that Jesus prayed for us? Did you know Jesus prayed for us? It's in John 17, 20. John 17, 20. This is Jesus' words for us. He had just got finished praying for his disciples. You can read for chapter 17 for yourself, but we pick it up at verse 20. Look what Jesus said. I do not ask for these only. He was talking about his disciples but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Who is that? Raise your hand if that's you. Yes, he said, we're going to pray. I'm not praying just for those, but for all those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be what? One. That they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they may also that they also may be in us so that the word world will believe that you have sent me. My God, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. I'm feeling a theme some here, somewhere in Jesus' prayer. Jesus had one theme. He had one focus. One thing he prayed for is that all of us would be one. Where did we lose this assignment? Where did we go wrong? We've turned church into so many other things. When Jesus prayed specifically for one thing, Father, let them be one so that people will know who I am. So you telling me that's the best evangelism model for us to be one? That's how people will know who Jesus is when we get together on one accord? Maybe we need to switch up the model. Maybe this is a part of the divine do-over. Maybe we need to lean into our oneness, into our usness. Then the world will know who Jesus is. Then they will see the love of the Father when we are one. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. So I have a theory, and y'all can test out this theory with me. Help me out, Sister Daisy. I have a theory that God, the reason why God loves community so much, he, it was God's idea. God created community. But my theory is that God loves community so much because God is community. God's self is a community. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God is community. This is how God showed up to us and manifested to us as community. In, the, in Genesis, it says, let us make man in our own image. God wasn't out here just doing the thing. God loves community. Everything God does, God does. I want you to go through the Bible. Tell me where. Show me where. God just was like one person go and do all the things. The, the, God always had people. He had disciples. He had followers. He had communities. Any prophet had apprentices, had disciples, had teachers. This is how God designed it. So something amazing happens when we're unified. Can you say that? Something amazing happens when we're unified. You know what happens? Heaven touches earth. Heaven touches earth when we are unified together. And I got two examples that I want to use, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. Y'all ready, Bible scholars? We are going to 2 Chronicles 5. 11. It's one of my favorite verses. I know I say that a lot, but this is one of my favorite verses. Second Chronicles 5, 11, and 14. I want to give some context. This is um, when King Solomon had just completed the temple. Now, this was his dad, David. David was Solomon's dad. This was David's dream. All David wanted to do was build a temple for the Lord. David had this huge palace, and he was like, it's not right that I'm living in all this royalty, and the tabernacle of God is some little 
pitched a tent out in the backyard. Like, no. He's like, I want to build a house. Just like I got a palace, I want to build a house for God. It want, it's going to be opulent. It's gonna be, and God was like, well, so your role, player. You got too much blood on your hands. You're a man of war. But I'll raise up your son. Your son will do it. So he, before David died, he provided everything Solomon would need to build this temple. We pick it up here in 2 Chronicles 5 when the temple was completed. Solomon did it, and it was like banging. It was like all kind. You got to read it. It's all kind of beautiful jewels and gold, and it was just a wonder to behold. So we pick it up right when they are dedicating the temple back to God. And it's in verse 11, 2 Chronicles 5, 11. It says, the priest then withdrew from the holy place. All the priests who were there had consecrated themselves regardless of their division. All the Levites who were the worship leaders and who were musicians, Asaph, he, Herman, Jed, Jed Dudin, yeah, there he is, and the sons and relatives stood on the east side of the altar, dressed in fine linen, playing cymbals, harps, and lyres. You better go ahead and play, y'all. And they were accompanied by, I want you to bookmark this, 120 priests surround sounding trumpets. 120 priests sounding trumpets. The trumpeters and musicians joined in what? Unison and gave praise and thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, the singers raised their voices in praise to the Lord and sang. This was their song. He is good, and his love endures forever. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with the cloud, and the priests could not perform their services because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. Hallelujah. This was, I want you to, if you would just go back and read this with your divine imagination and just imagine the symbols and the trumpets and the harps and the lyres and the people and all the things. And it says the glory of the Lord fill the temple. Now, this is one of my favorite things to talk about because the glory of the Lord is a Hebrew word called kavod, which means the weightiness of God. The weightiness of God. I love this word so much that I got it tattooed on my arm. This is the Hebrew word kavod that I got tattooed on my arm because it's one of my favorite concepts of the Bible. The weightiness, the weight of glory. Are you kidding me? That for that to be on our lives, this is what is called a tangible manifest presence of God that you can actually feel that there's a weight to it. Now, I want to talk to those who have been in a, in a worship service or a church service before, and you felt the presence of God in such a way that there's a weightiness to it. There's a, there's a presence. These are the things we want to talk about because these are the things we're expecting. So when it happens, when we're all back together again, you won't be unaware and you won't be like, what's going on? No, we, we are prepared for this life. We are talking about the manifest the manifest glory, the manifest presence of God. Now, this presence of God, let's just break down what the presence of God is. The presence of God is different from God being omnipresent. For we know that God is everywhere. Amen? God is everywhere at the same time, all places. The eyes of the Lord roam, roam to and fro. There's nowhere that God is not. There's nowhere you can go where God is not. God is always present. But we are talking today about God's manifest presence, God's divine blessing and loving embrace, the demonstration of his overwhelming glory and heavenly ma majesty. Amen. These are times when God used physical or earthly means of communica communicating with his people. They got the point that God was there and that they were in God's presence because they could feel it tangibly. Amen, amen. How many people would love to experience that type of glory? We're getting ready for that. And this is the same manifestation that Moses asked for. Y'all remember the story in Exodus when Moses, now I want you to check this. Moses had already seen the burning bush. 
Moses had already seen the ten plagues. He's seen the greatness of God, you know, rods turning to snakes, all kinds of crazy wonders. He also saw the Red Sea part. God, he's seen it all, but when he was on that mountain with God, there was one thing that Moses asked for. Moses said, God, show me your glory. Show me your glory. I, I, and, he, and he went on as far as to say, like, I, we're not going nowhere. Like, don't send us from this place unless your presence goes with us. If your presence doesn't go, go with us, then I don't want no part of it. And I'm here saying the same thing. Oh, God, if your presence doesn't go with us into 2022, if your presence doesn't go with the Way Christian Center, if your presence is not here, if your presence does not go with us from this time forth, then I don't really want to have much to do with it because I cannot live without your presence. Amen. Can does anybody else feel that way? There is no way I can live without your presence. And we don't want to be a church who is comfortable with living without the presence of God. We don't want to be a church that we just come in and do the things and we go back out and Jesus wasn't even in the room. This is the kind of life we want to live. He said, show me the glory. Show me your glory, oh God. And I don't want to move without it. Now, I want you to appreciate the fact that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Our God is so big and so powerful that God cannot be confined to a building or a space. That's why he was like, David, I appreciate you wanting me to build a, a, a tabernacle, but I don't really need buildings, you know, it's just a thing. But God still desires to dwell among his people. God loves to make an appearance and just start throwing his weight around in the building. How many know our God is weighty? There's a weighty presence of God, and God loves to show up. God loves to come and make an appearance and just begin to throw his weight around the building. And I am in great expectation of us leaning into this side of God. It says that God came in like a cloud. Come on, God came in like a cloud. And if you're, if you're um, walking through scripture, you'll see that God often shows up as a cloud. He, he showed up on Mount Sinai where our pastor was. Shout out to Pastor Mike. Pastor Mike actually walked up Mount Sinai. Touch the Lord. Touch, touch the Lord. That's what we're going to start. Touch the Lord. We ain't going to say touch your labor. Touch the Lord. He, um, and Mount Sinai is where God appeared in a cloud. And remember when Jesus was with his disciples in the transfiguration, God appeared in the cloud. When Jesus was getting baptized, Jesus, God appeared in the cloud. He spoke from a cloud. There's something about this cloud. God's tangible presence signifying heaven coming down to earth. The clouds are in heaven. We are on earth. God brings a cloud into the place to symbolize that heaven is here. Remember, we're praying, God, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's when the manifest presence of God is when we just get a little taste of heaven. Just a little. I don't know if you've ever been in a, in a church service when you just feel the presence of God so powerfully. It's just a small foretaste. It's just giving you a little crumb, a little morsel of what we will experience throughout eternity. Hallelujah. So how can we experience this as a church family? How do we experience the manifest presence of God. First of all, does anybody interested in, in experience this? Does it, am I in the right place? Do y'all, y'all, y'all looking at me, y'all at the right place? Are we interested in this manifest presence of God? So how do we experience, how do we attract God to our place? How do we attract God to the way Christian center? It says uh, a couple of things. Here's the reasons how we can do this. First of all, it says the, the priest were consecrated. Do you remember in verse 11, it says the priests were all consecrated. 
It means it cost them something. They had to sacrifice something. We've just been in a week of prayer and fasting and getting up at 6 a.m. That cost us something. We gave up something that we would usually go to throughout the week. That's a costly thing. That's when you consecrate yourself. When we live a consecrated lifestyle, a fasted lifestyle, a lifestyle that says, I won't let my flesh rule me, but I'll let my spirit control me, this is how God was attracted to this place. It also says in verse 13 that the people were unified. They were unified. They all they, they didn't come with different agendas or we going to do this or we going to do that. And I didn't feel like being here. And, oh, Lord, it's just too hot. It's too cold. They were all unified. And it says uh, that they worship. There was a worship of praise and thanksgiving. There was a worship. Go back and read the Second Chronicles 5, 11 through, through 12. There was a, a, a worship, a praise of thanksgiving. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. That means God, wherever there's praise, wherever there's worship, that's where God dwells. God lives in our praise. And I think this is so important because it doesn't say God lives in our preaching, but preaching is great. It doesn't say God lives in our evangelism and our life groups and our discipleships and our fellowships and our cookouts and our chicken dinners. It didn't say all that. It says that God inhabits, God lives, God dwells. Where? In our praises. So whenever we're praising and worshiping God, that's where God lives. That's where God wants to dwell in our praises. And lastly, it says, there was a revelation of God's goodness and love. Do y'all remember this song? It says, the song says, they only sang one song. It says, he is good and his love endures forever. It was one song. They had one song. It had two lines. It had lots of flutes and, and all the, the symbols and stuff. This was the, this was the Israelites' greatest hit. Go back in Scripture. Whenever they went out to war, whenever they put the, the worship team in front of the army, this was the song that they always sang, that the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. The Lord is good. His love endures forever. They had a revelation of God's love towards them. They had a revelation that no matter what we face, God loves us. God, his mercy endures. His faithfulness endures. They had a revelation of God's goodness whenever we are in worship together and we have a revelation of who God is and who God is towards us as a community, that God is always good. God is always merciful. God is always kind. God is always loving towards us. When you get a revelation of that, It changes everything. This is the revelation that the devil fights. The devil wants you to believe that God doesn't love you, that God doesn't care about you, that you've been left to the side, that you're no good, you have no purpose. You see, you don't, you don't, what, why are you even trying? You don't look the part, you don't act the part, you're just out here being an imposter. These are all the lies of the devil. But when you get a revelation that the Lord is good, God is good all the time, all the time, and God is good. When you get that revelation in your spirit to come what may, God is good. That is the core of your salvation. And I don't care what happens, God is good. Come hell or high water, death or life, God is good, period, period, right? And that it's love endures forever. This was the revelation that they got. That's what attracted God to this place. So, How do we, as a community, recognize when the presence of God is in the place? This is very important for us to recognize. When do we, because, you know, we get into a room or atmosphere, we're watching together virtually, and we get into this, you know, we're feeling something, and sometimes we're feeling the warm tinglys, or we're feeling like a, I don't know what this is, or I don't know, I just feel good. No, no, we want to recognize and expect when the presence of God. So what, what happens when glory fills the room? What happens when, when we feel God's manifest presence? First of all, it says in the verse, it says when, um, when the priest When the cloud came in, the priests couldn't even minister. They couldn't even perform. The pastor couldn't even get up to preach. There was nothing that could happen. What happens when we're in God's presence is that no flesh can stand. No flesh can stand before his presence. 
everything must bow before God. That's how you know where you are truly in the manifest presence of God that you can do nothing but bow down and worship. There's no uh, self that could be promoted. There's no, I had an agenda. No, we got to follow the program. No, I had a whole word with three points in a, in a scripture. No, everything stops in the manifest presence of God and everything must bow. I don't know if you've ever been in an atmosphere like that, but it is amazing when you can do nothing but bow before the, there's nothing more appropriate than just to bow on your face before God. Because that's all you can do. <laughs> because you're just undone. Because you're just recognizing that you are serving and before a mighty living God. And you're, we're so unworthy of who God is that all I can do is bow. This is the kind of life we want to live before God. It also it says, um, we don't, when we, how do you know? How, how do you know when God fills the room? We don't minister to God, but God ministers to us. That's how you know when God truly fills the room, that we're not just offering our praise, but everything stops and God starts ministering to you. God starts speaking specifically to your situation. Remember, we were talking about how the Holy Spirit will begin to give clarity in the presence of God. Clarity comes. Ideas come. Revelation comes. Strategy comes. How to handle situations. It all comes when the manifest glory of God is in the room, we don't, we, don't, we don't offer God anything else. God is ministering to us. That's an amazing place to be. And the last thing it says, how do we know when God really fills the room? When God shows up, the things of man stops. Everything stops. Ministry stops. Worship stops. There's a holy hush that comes on the room where we can do nothing else but just stand in the presence of God. Saints, I don't know about you, but this is the kind of community that I want to be a part of. This is the kind of worship that I want to be a part of. This is what I, I'm praying that our church experiences on a regular basis. And it's not uh, emotionalism. It's not conjuring something up. It's not us making up uh, things to do so we look spiritual. No. If you've ever been in these kind of rooms when the presence of God falls, there's nothing you could do but worship. This is the most amazing place, and this will be the culture of our church, amen? This will be the culture of our worship. This will be our, the culture of when people walk into the room, they can feel the manifest presence of God. Anybody signing up for that? Anybody on board with that? All right, here we go. Now, I just told you we had a New Testament, we had an Old Testament example I'm going to close with a New Testament example of the manifest glory, the manifest presence of God. And it happens in our one of our favorite verses, because y'all know we at Pentecostal church around here. Acts 2, 1 and 4. Acts 2. And I want you to bookmark in your mind. Remember, there were 120 priests in that Old Testament uh, passage. In this passage, we find ourselves, Jesus has just risen from the dead and gone into heaven, he told the disciples to stay and wait for the promise of the Father. There were 120 people gathered in the upper room. 120 people were there waiting on the promise of God. And it reads, Acts 2, 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with what? One accord. They were all with one accord. In one place, the power of unity. Whenever we're unified together, I'm telling you, heaven touches earth. When they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there, there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. There is power in unity. When we are unified, when we are together in one place with one mind in one accord, this is when we experience the presence of God. This is because God loves community, because God loves oneness. 
this is where God makes an appearance like, oh, no, they, they doing exactly what I said. Let me, let me show them. Let me, let me come into the room. Let me set a vibe. Let me begin to minister to my people. So this is the good news of, this, of all this. There's good news. Y'all want the good news? The good news is that God is no longer interested in just filling houses. God's not interested in just filling temples. God's not interested in just filling churches as he did in the Old Testament. And we, because we are living in this new dispensation, because we are new covenant believers, God is interested in filling temples. And did you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? God loves, you know, God loves, you know, to come into the room and fill it. But something happened when the flames of fire sat on each one of them. Remember the log example when we're doing a campfire? When each one of us are filled, when each one of us are on fire, when each one of us come together corporately, and then something amazing happens. God fills the room because we're unified. We come together. God's filling each of us individually, but not just for us to be like, ooh, God filled me, and I felt good, and I'm doing all the things. Look at me. I'm a wonder. No, it's not for you to shine. It's not for you to take your moment. It's not for you to have your 15 seconds of fame. That's not why God's filling us. That's not why God's putting his fire in you. The fire is for the group fire, the group community, the group campfires, the group fireplace. When we are all individually on fire, we can all come together and burn so brightly that the city will see, that the country will see, that people walking by will see the light, will see the glory of God. The other thing, the good news is that 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 cloud, whenever we saw a manifestation of God in the Old Testament, the cloud, pillar of cloud, the fire, the pillar, all these manifestations were just a sign pointing to Jesus. Do you guys know that Jesus, Jesus is the cloud. <laughs> Jesus is the manifest manifestation of God's glory. And he, Jesus is Shekinah glory manifested. And that, uh, that passage in 2 Chronicles That's called the Shekinah glory, when God fills the house in a tangible way. Well, guess what? Jesus is the Shekinah glory. Jesus is glory manifested. He is kavod, fulfilled. Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus is the brightness of the radiance of God's glory. It is Jesus who now, we don't have to look for a cloud to come in. We don't have to look for a fire and all these signs. It's living within you. If you are a follower and a believer of God, everything that was manifested in the Old Testament is now inside of you. You have the pillar of fire uh, in, in your heart. You have the cloud in your heart. It's leading you. It's guiding you. It's inside of you. You have the fire burning brightly. It's inside of you. You have a cloud and a witness. It's inside of you. This is who Jesus is. Jesus came to fulfill that. So our prayer as a church, our prayer as a community is, Lord, show us your glory. It's our prayer as a community. It's our sole purpose. God, show us your glory. It's our corporate prayer. We don't want to go into this new season without you. We're not doing a, we have this chance for this divine do-over. We have a chance to come back in a new way that we're not doing the old things, but we're leaning into the new. God, we need you. Show us your glory. Because where your presence is, is the fullness of joy. How many people need joy? Not just, you know, happiness, but the fullness, the fullness of joy is found in God's presence. Where this is where we find pleasures at your right hand. Everything that you're looking for to take the spot in your heart to give you pleasure, no matter what it is, you that's what the presence of God is for. It's the place where the Holy Spirit speaks to us directly and God ministers to us both directly and corporately. This is our prayer. God, show us your glory. Can you just say that with me? God, show us your glory. God, show us your glory as a, as a church home. God, show us your glory as the Way Christian Center. Whenever we're together in any capacity, whether we're in person or virtually, God, let us be 
in a place where we are seeing your glory. So these are our reflection questions for the week. This is what we're going to be thinking about. I'm, I'm calling them the, our Selah questions. These are things for us to stop and pause and reflect on, our Selah questions. How can we proactively lean into the both and, the personal Pentecost, and the corporate anointing? Remember, it has to be a balance. It can't just be one or the other. You can't be, as long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. And you can't be like, I don't need my private time with God because I got the corporate anointing. There is a balance, and we need to live in the both end, and we need to lean into both. So how can you proactively, how can you proactively lean into having your own fire, your own time, your own precious time with God and the Holy Spirit, your own time where you're worshiping and getting catching on fire for yourself and then bringing that fire that you've tended to in your heart to the corporate fire. Amen. Second thing, how can we have a united mindset when we engage together? Think about this. How can we have a united mindset? A united mindset means that whenever we get together in any capacity, whether you're watching with the way is everywhere or whether you're back in person with us, no matter how we're watching, that we are keeping Jesus as the main attraction. Amen? Not who's preaching, not who's singing, not if the announcements look good, nothing else. We are coming here in whatever capacity we engage, we are coming to have Jesus, to put Jesus as the main attraction. And number two, how do we keep a united mindset? No one has to coerce you to worship. Whenever we get together, we shouldn't, no one, the worship leader shouldn't have to beg you, put your hands together, lift your hands, turn around three times, run, run back and forth. We don't have to do all that. We don't have to try to coerce you to worship because you've already came with a worship. You realize you've had a revelation of God's goodness. You've had a revelation of God's love for yourself. So when we get together, we're just coming with a united mindset that I'm here to worship God. And also a united mindset is um, you're not coming. We're not coming as spectators, but we're coming to participate. Amen. Even if you're engaged online. You didn't just come to turn it on and be doing other things. Or you didn't just come to into the building just to watch and see, like, I wonder what they're going to do today. No, we're not coming to spectate. We're coming to participate. This is how we are on a united mindset. And then lastly, when we have a united mindset, we come knowing that as we pour out, God will refill us. Amen. Whenever we get together, whatever you pour out, so that's whether your time, whether your worship, whether you're using your gifts and your talents, whether you're helping with Yana, whether you're being a greeter, whether you're on hospitality, whether you're serving to pray over people, whatever capacity that you come and pour out, God is going to pour back into you. So you don't have to worry about, well, if I help, I'm going to miss out. Or if I come, I ain't going to be able to get my full experience because I'm coming to get my blessing. You don't have to worry about that because God will always take care of you and will pour back into you whatever you pour out because there's no scarcity in God. There's no scarcity in God. So you can come, be engaged. You could be in the chat or you could be in this room. And whatever you pour out in gifts and talents, don't forget God will give it back to you. This is how we could be on a united mindset. And when we all come with these community agreements that we've come to worship Jesus, that we've come to lift up the name of Jesus, that we've come to experience the presence of God, something amazing will happen. Heaven will touch earth and we will be overwhelmed with God's glory. God will minister to us directly in so many unique ways. And we will never be the same. You'll never be the same once you experience the presence of God. I always say with the Yana kids, with our young and out of shame, if we could just get them into the presence of God. They'll never be the same. Nothing else will satisfy. 
no drugs, no sex, no nothing will nothing will ever satisfy. Once you've experienced the presence of God, there's nothing else like it. So this is what we want here. Amen. God, we say, have your way at the way. This is what we want. This is the culture that we want. This is the divine do-over that we want. God, this is how we want to engage with you. And we come with expectation. We come that whenever we are together in whatever capacity that you will meet us there so tangibly that we could feel your presence, that we'll know you're real, that we'll feel your loving embrace. God, that you will, that people will walk in here and be transformed by the renewing of their mind because they can feel your love. They can know your love. God, we pray that you would change us in your presence. God, speak to us in your presence. God, let this be a unique place where people can find you, can know you, and feel that they belong. God, we thank you for all that you're doing in our church. God, we thank you for this week that we've been praying over our church. We thank you for this month of a divine do-over. And God, we say that we invite your glory. God, we want to see your glory. God, we say we surrender. God, we're so sorry for what we've made it. God, we're coming back like the song says. We're coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. God, we're so sorry for the things that we've made it before, the things that we made church before, the idols that we set up before you. God, we want this to be all about you. And I just want to pray for those who are watching right now who may not even know you. If you're watching and you're like, this is amazing, I want to have a relationship with this God who's the creator of heaven and earth, but yet wants to take personal time to reveal God's self to me. If that's you, you say, you know what? I want to invite the Lord into my life. I want to be saved. Can you just repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for your sacrifice. I invite you into my life. I declare that you are Lord. Help me to follow you. Help me to become a disciple of you. Thank you for your plans and purposes for my life. In Jesus' name.